Good day. Over the last couple of days, I have been discussing in various programs the fact that the Russian attacks in Ukraine appear to be gaining momentum, and we are getting further confirmation of this now, every single day, with every single day. Again, the center remains Avdeevka. We've now had more film and photographic evidence about where the Russian soldiers have reached, the places where the Russian soldiers have reached. Interestingly, it comes from Ukrainian sources, to be precise, from the 110th Brigade, the unit which is tasked with defending Avdeevka from the Russians and which forms the core of Ukrainian defense in Avdeevka. They they've released videos showing attacks by their FPV drones on Russian formations. And these videos, what they actually do is confirm the extent of Russian progress. The Russians seem to be advancing rapidly through along various streets in southern Avdeevka. The there doesn't seem to be much in the way of Ukrainian resistance to try to slow them down. The only thing that the Ukrainians seem to be able to do for the moment is to launch FPV drones against these advancing Russians. And one has to wonder, actually, how many FPV drones the um, 110th Brigade actually has. I doubt that it is able to make any where it is located in Avdeevka itself. Maybe it's able to get supplies of these things from uh, Ukraine. I simply have no idea. But anyway, for the moment, the only thing that seems to be slowing down the Russian advances in this area, in southern Avdeevka, are these FPV drone attacks. Now, you can find the film of these um, drone attacks um, on the Military Summary Channel, and Dima, in his com commentary on the Military Summary Channel, made a very interesting point, which is through that through the capture of the territory um, that the Russians have achieved in their attacks over the last couple of days, they now control all the high ground around Abdevka. Abdevka, as is often the case, lies on lower ground than the higher ground around it. The Russians now control that higher ground. They're able to look down upon Avdeevka from all the surrounding hills. And that, of course, puts them in a good position to track and observe what the Ukrainians in Avdeevka itself are doing. And, of course, assuming they're able to haul up artillery and mortars and such things, which I presume they will be able to, onto this high ground. I presume that they will be able to launch artillery strikes on other positions within Avdeevka um, as they choose. I am sure that there are other attacks taking place around Avdeevka as well. Um, the made, most of the information about the advance on Avdeevka um, focuses on the admittedly dramatic events in the southern part of Avdeevka. But I strongly suspect that the Russians are also able to advance, um, have been pushing hard to advance in other places. And I've also seen reports that because of the general shortage of manpower, the Ukrainians are trying to stem the Russian advance in the south of Avdeevka by transferring soldiers from other parts of the perimeter around Avdeevka. But of course, that is leaving uh, those other parts of the perimeter short of men and opens up possibilities for the Russians to attack in these other places also. Now, in his program um, on the Military Summary Channel, Dima also made a further point that there are two 
important fortified positions south of where the Russians are advancing, Ukrainian fortified positions, south of the furthest point of the Russian advance. Um, one appears to be some kind of, well, it's referred to as an air base, but it looks too small to be an air base exactly. But anyway, that is what it's referred to. Um, these are apparently heavily fortified Ukrainian positions. If the Russians are able to maintain their advance and to consolidate on the ground that they've already captured, then the Ukrainian troops in these two fortified positions will be trapped and presumably, therefore, in order to avoid that happening, the Ukrainian command in Avdeevka will withdraw those troops from these two fortified positions, which will result in more territory around Avdeevka, passing further under Russian control and with the Russians tightening their grip on the southern areas of Avdeevka itself. Avdevka, I should say, is a town of around 30,000 people, or at least it was before the current fighting began in February 2022. So it's not a huge place, but it's certainly significantly bigger than a village. And I'm not going to try and engage in percentages, but it seems to me that even with all of these advances that the Russians <coughs> have achieved, there's still quite a long distance from getting to the centre of Avdevka. I suspect that there is still very intense fighting ahead. I suspect that the fight for Avdevka will continue for some time, though I'm not going to try and guess how long. Um, but anyway, the trajectory of travel, as I like to say, is clear. Avdevka, the Ukrainian defences in Avdevka are crumbling. The Russians are now fighting well inside the town itself. They control buildings within Avdevka. And of course, almost certainly, they're pressing hard in places like Pervomaisky to the southwest and in Stepovoye and along the railway to the northwest. So, a lot going on in and around Avdevka, and as I said, significant Russian advances over the last 24 hours, coming on top of those other advances that the Russians had achieved earlier. Now, there is an interesting fact about the situation in Avdevka, which shows how confused, how, con how confused the West must be about these developments because I read the British media carefully and I've noticed that to a great extent they have not reported these events in Avdevka, these dramatic events in Avdevka over the last few hours. If you got your news about what's going on in Ukraine on the battlefronts, certainly from the British um, newspapers, you would not know that there was this Ukrainian collapse in southern Avdevka. In fact, if you followed the war carefully, but based all your understanding of what is going on in the war from the mainstream media in Britain, you would probably think that Avdevka was the scene of some great Russian debacle, that the Russians have suffered uh, some big defeat in Avdevka that they attempted to capture this place in October, but had suffered enormously heavy losses of men and equipment in Avdevka. I believe the United States has claimed that 13,000 Russian troops have died or been wounded in Avdevka. And as I said, those are the reports that people in Britain, at least, and I think to a great extent in the United States, probably in Europe as well. Um, that's the impression that they've been given about what the situation in Avdevka is. And the British Ministry of Defence, for example, in its daily bulletins, I've noticed that it's saying absolutely nothing 
about what is going on in Avdevka. The closest they've come is that they mentioned, I think it was yesterday or the day before yesterday, that the Russians have intensified their assaults along the combat line, largely taking um, advantage of the frozen ground, which is one way of describing it. Um, they've also talked about the fortifications. This is another intelligence briefing, the fortifications that the Ukrainians are apparently building. They also claim that the Ukrainians are clinging on to their bridgehead in um, Krinky, and the Russians supposedly have failed in their repeated attempts to eliminate that bridgehead. Well, that actually is strictly true. Um, there are still Ukrainian troops in Krinky. They do still cling on to a few buildings, perhaps, in Krinky, and perhaps trenches along the shoreline. But as I discussed in several videos now, it does look as if we're talking about perhaps 50 men in total. And the reality is that this bridgehead appears to have, to all intents and purposes, imploded, essentially collapsed. And of course, we've had lots of reports about this from Russian sources, but also some confirmation from Ukrainian sources also. Anyway, the British Ministry of Defense, they've said nothing about a collapse of Ukrainian defenses in southern Avdeevka. This is notwithstanding, as I said, that we now have um, photographic and film evidence, which has been produced by the Ukrainians themselves, which show the extent of those Russian advances. The one outlet in the West that is acknowledging that things are not going well for the Ukrainians in Avdevka is the Institute for the Study of War, which is reporting Russian advances in Avdevka, though even the Institute for the Study of War is not giving the full picture, uh, a, a sense of the full extent of the Russian advances in Avdevka itself. So I think, again, I just wanted to mention all of this. Um, the reality, or so it seems to me, is that even though it's become painfully clear over the course of the fighting that the United States takes a lot of its information, far too much of its information, about what's going on on the battlefield from the Ukrainians. Um, it's clear that the United States does have some sense that things are going badly wrong on the battlefronts, that the situation is not in stalemate, that the Ukrainians are losing the war. Um, we know this because, of course, we had that um, report couple of days ago uh, from NBC that Jake Sullivan, Avril Haines have briefed members of Congress. They're talking about the dynamics of the battlefront on the battlefronts clearly being negative for Ukraine. And they said that without emergency support from the United States, of course, it's not clear what sort of support they envisage, but without emergency support from the United States, Ukraine could collapse within weeks or months at most. Now, some people, myself included, have expressed some skepticism about the claim that Ukraine is about to collapse in weeks or months. Ukraine is an enormous country. Again, this is a fact which Perhaps many people don't understand, but in terms of territory, it is very big. It is the second biggest country in Europe after Russia itself in terms of its territorial extent. The Russians control around a fifth of pre-2014 Ukraine. Um, they have been pushing forward for 80% of Ukraine. Pre-2014, Ukraine is still under Ukrainian control. 
And um, as has been pointed out by many people, if you look at the map, if you look at a small scale map, it would seem that the situation on the battlefronts has not really shifted that much since the Ukrainian offensives in Kharkov and Kherson region in the autumn of 2022. However, <laughs> the realities are that the Ukrainians have suffered shocking levels of attrition. Even Western reports admit to enormous, staggering Ukrainian casualties. That's a word that I saw in one Western news report. I believe it was in the Financial Times. Um, key sit towns like Bakhmut have been captured by the Russians. Avdevka is in the process of being captured by the Russians. The Russians are pushing forward towards Chasov Yar and other places. We'll come to that in a moment. And of course, the Russians are continuing to cause enormous damage to the Ukrainian air defense system through their continued missile barrages and their hunting of um, Ukrainian air defense operators and launchers. By the way, just the other day, they reported on the destruction of another Ukrainian air defense launch system, an Iris T supplied by Germany. And I believe that a book missile system, which apparently now launches American missiles, that it's been just, it was knocked out as well. But anyway, um, in reality, there is no stalemate on the battlefronts. In reality, there is significant changes on the battlefronts. If you go close up, the Russians may not be gaining hundreds of kilometers of territory, but the territory that they're gaining is important territory. And more importantly, the Ukrainian military is suffering tremendous attrition. And I still think that it's going to take a lot more than a couple of weeks before this uh, Ukrainian collapse that um, Sullivan and Haynes were walk warning about happens. They were clearly doing that. They were clearly giving these warnings in order to panic Congress into authorizing further appropriations. But it's still possibly the case that if things continue in the way that they are going at the moment, <clears throat> then we could start to see further signs of collapse, or at least more signs of collapse, genuine collapse, perhaps in a couple of months' time, sometime perhaps in mid to late spring. Bear in mind that if the Russians capture um, Avdevka and are able to push on and capture the village of Ocheritenia further to the north, apparently that puts them in a good position to advance towards the Dnieper and um, perhaps to outflank other Ukrainian forces in um, Donbass. And if the Russians are able to press on from Marinka through Gergievka, and there's been some reports that they have made further progress in advancing in Gergievka, they're able to push from Gergievka on to Kurakovo, it seems likely that Ukrainian defense lines around Vugladar, further south, will start to crumble also. And if the Russians are able to capture Kupiansk and Siversk, well, and Chasov Yar near Bakhmut, that will put them in a strong position to attack Slavyansk and Kramatorsk, the two important cities in Donbass which remain outside Russian control. And as I've discussed many times, if the Russians do finally manage to bring the entirety of Donbass under their control, 
<clears throat> that puts them in a very strong position to advance to the Dnieper. And if they do that, I personally find it very difficult to see how Ukraine would be able to sustain a long-term war effort with the Russians, in effect, having Ukraine by the throat. So, just to say, it may be, it may be taking, it may, it almost certainly will take longer than um, Haynes and Sullivan said, but perhaps not quite as long as some people think. Anyway, if present trends continue, but then there's no obvious reason why they won't. But anyway, coming back to the situation on the battlefronts, um, obviously, as I said, the big news is coming from Avdevka, but there are reports that the Russians are indeed pushing forward in the um, Marinka area, as I said, towards Kurakovo. Um, we've had far less news about what's going on around Novo Mikhailovka, uh, this village to the south of Marinka. Um, but as we've seen in Avdevka, the fact that we're getting no news from one particular location on the battlefronts doesn't necessarily take us, tell us that there is nothing actually happening in that part of the battlefronts. And the same, by the way, um, about the situation north of Bakhmut, where the Russians recently captured that village of Veseloye. We've not heard many reports about what the Russians are doing north or in the area of Veseloye, but that doesn't mean that they're actually sitting on their hands and doing nothing. It could be that they are, or that they have been engaged in further battles, possibly aiming towards eventual capture of Siversk. It could be that the Russians simply don't want to disclose to the world the extent of their progress. And the Ukrainians also, perhaps, for the moment, don't want to disclose to the world the extent of Russia's progress. But one thing we can say is that further north, in the Kupiansk, Liman area, things do seem to be intensifying. The Russians captured that village um, in the Kupiansk area, They see, which I discussed yesterday. I'm afraid I'm struggling with the name of this particular village. No doubt I will eventually manage it. Um, this apparently positions them, uh, gives them a position from which they can strike at Ukrainian positions along the Oskol River. The Russians reach the Oskol River in this area. They will be able to interfere with Ukrainian um, supplies to Kupiansk and other places. There are also reports that the Russians are now renewing their attack on Sinkovka, close to Kupiansk itself. And as I've discussed also in recent programs, the Russians are now systematically bombing and conducting air and missile strikes um, in the area of Kupiansk with Russian helicopter gunships and bomb, uh, jet aircraft um, active in that area as well. So it's quite likely that even as Abdevka um, moves towards its inevitable outcome, we shall start to see the same thing happen around Kupiansk as well. And in Bakhmut, that other most bloody part of the battlefronts, the fighting around Bakhmut has, been, has achieved levels of savagery which have not been matched anywhere else on the battlefronts in this war. Anyway, in Bakhmut, there's been more reports of further Russian advances towards the village of Ivaniska, and importantly within Bogdanovka, the village to the northwest of Bakhmut. Large village, um, 
has a long, uh, a significant amount of territory to capture before the Russians are in full control of this village. Some reports now say that they have captured the center of this village and that the Ukrainians only control the southwest of this village. And again, Dima at the Military Summary Channel can provide you with all kinds of maps showing what the Russians' progress in this area is. But it is significant and it is bringing the Russians closer all the time to Chasov Yar, which presumably is their objective. Anyway, so very bad situation on the front lines for Ukraine and nothing very much being said about it so far in the Western media. I'm going to discuss the situation in the Western media and the efforts at optimism that we still find there shortly. But suffice to say <laughs> that um, even as the Ukrainians are being pushed back along the battlefronts, in these kind of situations, they revert to doing that which they usually do uh, when they're under pressure, which is strike at what you might call soft targets. So yesterday, <clears throat> I discussed the um, shelling of the market near Donetsk city. Russian, one Russian report says that this was carried out by uh, two um, M109 Paladin self-propelled howitzers um, located near the town of Kurakovo, which is of course the objective of the Russian advance from Marinka through Gergievka. The Russians are pushing towards Kurakovo itself. If it is indeed the case that the, it was these two artillery pieces that carried out that attack on Donetsk city, one can understand further why Kurakovo is an important objective for the Russians. And it's been suggested that the, the ammunition used in this attack was cluster munitions with some kind of um, gas or rocket system um, attached to the shell in order to enhance the range. And one can't help but feel that this really grisly attack, the death toll has now been assessed by the Russians, by the Russian civilian authorities in Donetsk city as being um, around 25 when I last looked. Anyway, that this particular attack is in some way connected to the fighting in Avdevka. The Ukrainians trying to show to the people of Donetsk city that even though Avdevka itself might be in the progress, in the process of falling, Ukraine is still able to hit Donetsk city and the people of Donetsk city should not think that because Avdevka is eventually going to be captured by the Russians, that that means that Ukraine has lost its ability to reach them. I know that is a disturbing calculus, but I think it is the true one to explain what the Ukrainians have just done. Again, there's been virtually no comment about this market uh, shelling in the Western media. Uh, I think that I saw one report, it might have been in The Guardian, or it might have been somewhere else, where Russian claims that this incident happened were reported, but there was no real commentary or discussion of the incident itself, and certainly no attempt to find out what the actual truth of this attack, of these claims, actually is. Anyway, that's 
One thing that Ukraine has been doing does seem as if the Ukrainians have launched more attacks on other targets in Russia. There's been a whole cascade of reports on the U Russian uh, Defense Ministry about drone attacks and attempted missile attacks by the Ukrainians on all kinds of targets across Russia and in the um, zone of conflict. It's not, again, always easy to figure out exactly what is happening. But there is one rather tantalizing claim, which is based upon one event which has indisputably taken place. In St. Petersburg, near the port of St. Petersburg, uh, there has been a major fire in a gas terminal. Um, not just the terminal, I believe it's a port uh, from which liquefied natural gas is shipped. There is a major fire there. Um, there's been a lot of work in by the Russian authorities to bring this fire under control. And inevitably, perhaps, there have been claims that this fire was caused by a Ukrainian drone attack. Maybe it was. The um, Institute for the Study of War um, <coughs> appears to ex well, accept that it was a Ukrainian drone attack. And it makes the remarkable claim that the air defences around St. Petersburg, the Russian air defences around St. Petersburg, are supposedly rather weak or in poor condition. I find that extremely unlikely. I'm not in a position, obviously, to know what the Russian air defence system is like. Obviously, it can't be strong in every location. But given that St. Petersburg is Russia's biggest port, <laughs> at least its biggest city on the sea, that is located on the Black on the Baltic Sea, that it is a major port and an enormous industrial facility, and by the way, an enormous military complex. Many of the big factories and production sites in St. Petersburg produce weapons for the Russian military. It's a major location of the Russian military industrial complex, and given that the Russia's Baltic fleet is located, well, not well, partly in St. Petersburg, principally in the port city, in the island of Kronstadt, but also in Kaliningrad. But as I said, St. Petersburg is clearly a major location there. And of course, there's these shipyards and all of these things, shipyards which make submarines and warships for the Russian Navy. I would have thought that St. Petersburg would be one of the best defended locations in Russia. And that seems logical to me. Now, of course, it could be that this, the realities are otherwise, maybe through the neglect or incompetence or through the diversion of air defense assets to other more vulnerable places. The air defenses of St. Petersburg have been weakened. Who knows? I don't know. But... On the face of it, I would, I would want further explanation, some facts, before I accepted this extraordinary claim from the Institute for the Study of War as true. That doesn't mean, of course, that it was not a Ukrainian drone which caused this fire. Um, the Russians are not confirming that it was but then it would be embarrassing to them if it was. So perhaps it's unsurprising that they're not saying. Uh, the Ukrainians, of course, are busy hinting that it was indeed their drone which caused this fire. But then again, the Ukrainians probably would claim that it was one of their drones that caused this fire, even if it was an industrial accident. We simply do not know. I am not going to try and guess or speculate Again, I want to stress, I have no way of saying, but it is 
the case that Ukraine does seem to have tried to make up to some extent for the problems it is having on the battlefronts by launching more drone attacks on Russia. And maybe one did get through and did cause this fire at this LNG terminal in St. Petersburg. That's, I think, all one can say about that. Anyway, um, what, whatever, whether, as I said, the, was it a Ukrainian drone that caused this fire at the LNG terminal, this horrible attack on the market in Donetsk, or the other drone attacks, the key thing to understand is that none of this is going to improve Ukraine's military position. By now, as we approach the end of the second year of this conflict, that ought to be obvious, but it seems that Ukraine, having no other option, nonetheless persists with the attacks on this of this kind. Now, yesterday, I discussed at very considerable length the reports, and I'm going to stick with the word reports because I think that they're more than rumours, with the reports that President Zelensky has either dismissed General Zeluzhny or is reported to have dismissed General Zeluzhny or is planning to dismiss General Zeluzhny and that the chief of Ukraine's military intelligence, Kirill Bordanov, is being appointed to take um, Zeluzhny's place. And it should be said immediately that there has been no announcement to this effect from Ukraine, from Kiev today or yesterday. So to all appearances, Zeluzhny is still in, in post and Bordanov remains in his post. But of course, this is likely, as I said yesterday, if it is going to happen at all, to be a bitterly contested, acrimonious um, battle. Um, it could be that Zelensky has told Zeluzhny that he's dismissed. It could be that Zeluzhny is refusing to admit that he is dismissed. It could be that key generals are backing Zeluzhny in this battle. And it could be that this thing is playing out, um, playing out um, without the wider world being told. There are some further reasons to think that the situation in Kiev is indeed once again becoming very difficult, that politically the tensions are um, spilling over. The mayor of Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko, who used to be a major figure within the Maidan movement during the 2013-2014 protests. In fact, many people at the time mistakenly assumed that he was the leader of the protests. He never was. Uh, but, any, uh, but anyway, uh, Vitaly Klitschko has now been making increasingly critical statements again about President Zelensky. He says that Ukraine can no longer be considered a democracy, that um, Zelensky has centralized enormous amount of control in his hands, that the level of speech suppression and state repression in um, Ukraine is intensifying all of the time. And anyway, Klitschko gives the impression that the Maidan um, movement, the uprising, the revolution of dignity of 2014 has been betrayed, but that's his view, and that Ukraine is completely on the wrong track. Now, why would Klitschko come out and say that? Well, he has said that several times before. It could be that this is just another example of this. 
But I can't help but wonder again whether Klitschko perhaps has been alarmed by the reports that Zaluzhny has been dismissed and felt that he had to weigh in and make his feelings about Zelensky clear whilst he still could. So, you know, it could be that this is a sign, another telltale sign, that there is political conflict in Kiev. But something else has happened over the last couple of hours, which I tend to think um, perhaps makes still clearer the fact that there are tensions in Kiev and which might point to the strategy that is now perhaps gradually being worked out and adopted, Ukraine's strategy for continuing the war. And that is that President Zelensky has signed a most bizarre decree. Now, there have been multiple comments from all sorts of people that Ukraine has to accept that there is no prospect of it regaining the territories it's lost, Donbass, Crimea, and all of the others. Um, the Ukrainian government, Zelensky, and um, his foreign minister, Kuleba, and his advisor, Podolyak, and his chief of staff, Yermak, have all furiously denounced all such demands that they give up territory. Anyway, uh, this comes up from time to time. Apparently, it came up again whilst Zelensky and his team were in Davos. It's difficult. To, there hasn't been the single big dramatic event in Davos of, involving Zelensky that we've sometimes seen in the past. But my overall sense is that Zelensky, his event, his trip to Davos, did not go especially well. Certainly he did not come back with any concrete pl pledges of aid from the West. And of course, over the course of the last few days, the German parliament, the Bundestag, has voted by a big margin to block the transfer of Taurus long-range missiles to Ukraine. But anyway, um, Z Zelensky has come under pressure. The Ukrainian government has come under pressure. <clears throat> Either to agree with the Russians a freeze of the war along the current line of control, something which the Russians have also always rejected, or to acknowledge the inevitable reality that the Eastern territories Crimea, Donbass, and all the others, the territory currently occupied by the Russians, has been irretrievably lost. And Zelensky, as I said, and his officials have always resisted that. Now Zelensky has tried to perhaps underline his rejection because he has issued a decree which appears to open up Ukrainian claims to large territories within what might be called 2014 Russia. He says that these were historic Ukrainian territories. He says that the Ukrainian um, culture and language and people in these territories has been suppressed by the Russians. And he wants this whole question of these territories to be reopened. It's difficult to see this as anything other than a territorial claim. Now, this, on the face of it, is bizarre at a time when the Russians, as I said, are advancing and when Ukraine is clearly losing the war. Um, it could be that it is, again, Zelensky's way of making it clear that Ukraine is not going to accept territorial concessions to Russia. On the contrary, it should be given territory 
by Russia, not conceding its territory to Russia. But I can't help but think that it's perhaps intended to win support for Ukraine, Zelensky from the more extreme Ukrainian nationalistic hardliners concentrated in the political leadership in Kiev as he moves towards the dismissal of General Zeluzhny. Now, bear in mind that Zeluzhny himself has apparently had close connections with Ukrainian nationalist circles in the past. He keeps pictures of Bandera, Stepan Bandera, in his office, for example. They're there on visible public display. So it could be that in seeking to stake out these maximalist claims, which correspond with the maximalist demands of the Ukrainian nationalist movement, Zelensky is trying to undermine the support for Zeluzhny amongst precisely the same group of people, and also to win them over to his side. And of course, one of the people who perhaps would be attracted to that point of view is General Budanov, Kirill Budanov, the intelligence chief, who is widely believed to also share these maximalist objectives in terms of the conflict with Russia. And of course, it is precisely Budanov who the reports claim Zelensky now wants to appoint in Zeluzhny's place. So we might be about to see a further pivot towards the hardline nationalists. Again, I'm using somewhat measured language to describe these people. Others would use stronger terms to describe them. But anyway, we could be about to see a further pivot towards these hardline nationalists as part of this reshuffle that um, Zelensky supposedly is trying to carry out. Well, we'll see. Now, there is something else that I wanted to say, and this flows from an email, or rather emails, <laughs> that both... I and my colleague Alex Christoforou have received from a regular, well, in my case, from a regular um, contributor and member of the Durand community, somebody who has provided enormously helpful information about the war in the past. And this person, who does have a military background, by the way, has made the point <laughs> that, yes, on the face of it, appointing Budanov, who has no command experience, no senior command experience, to the post of Chief of General Staff and military commander of the Ukrainian armed forces in a war. Well, that does seem a rather odd thing to do. I mean, you would presumably need a general with some battlefield experience, not um, an expert in covert operations, such as Budanov is in that post. Well, it might seem strange, except, of course, if the plan, going beyond what I discussed yesterday about controlling the Ukrainian military, maintaining observation of the various generals and keeping them in line, the plan also is to prepare for the end of the war in conventional military terms, for Russia's conventional military victory, and then prepared for an insurgency war against the Russians. Now, this has been talked about in the past. It was talked about 
as I remember, extensively before the fighting in February 2022 began. There was a report that the US, CIA and the State Department had warned their opposite numbers in Moscow that if the Russians went ahead and occupied Ukraine, then the United States would back an insurgency war against the Russians in Ukraine. So this is not a new idea, and it may be if Jake Sullivan and Avril Haines are to be believed and that the United States really does worry that the war, the conventional war in Ukraine is coming to an end and that the Russians are now on the brink of winning it. It could be that this is now the new plan, you know, creating fortified lines to hold back the Russians. That isn't going to work. We've just seen fortified in lines in Avdevka collapse. The Russians are able to move forward despite them. Uh, the plan to march on Crimea um, from this bridgehead in Krinky has also ignominiously collapsed. So the conventional war is failing. It's looking increasingly as if the Russians will win. There can be no negotiations. This has been categorically ruled out by the Ukrainians. The United States cannot resolve its own political disputes about this issue, leaving the initiative with the hardliners who do not want to see negotiations. The British government is adamantly opposed to negotiations. So as hardline people in the EU. So since the Russians are winning the war and negotiations cannot happen, we're going back to the plan of the insurgency that we're going to try to orchestrate and organize in Ukraine. And if that is the plan, who better to do this, to do it than Kirill Budanov? Budanov is a completely incompetent intelligence officer. If we're talking about actual intelligence, the kind of work that you would suppose the military intelligence of the armed forces of Ukraine to be about, assessing Russian military capabilities, working out how strong the Russian army is, trying to second guess its plans or work out what its plans are, trying to understand the political situation in Moscow. Well, it's clear that the Ukrainian military intelligence is hopeless at that. We have what the Financial Times even acknowledges is hobby horse ideas like the fact that Putin has cancer and um, that the people who we see speaking for him on television, that they're actual clones or doubles. We Budana brought that up again in his interview with the Financial Times uh, that appeared the other day. We have the increasingly far-fetched and absurd claims about Russian weapons production, about Russian, uh, uh, um, the Russians, the scale of the Russian build-up, uh, Russian losses, all of that sort of thing. So it is a terrible intelligence organization. But it has shown a certain skill in conducting special operations, covert operations, which is completely unsurprising, given that Budanov himself is someone who has worked as a special forces soldier. It is what he knows and it is what he understands. He doesn't appear to be interested in the hard grind of intelligence connection and um, analysis, but you know, planting bombs on the Kerch Bridge, assassinating people in Moscow, um, doing all that kind of thing. Well, that absolutely is his sort of thing. And what better person, therefore, can you have, given that he's clearly got networks that 
assist him in doing these things, both in Ukraine and in Russia. Who better for that than Budanov? And going back to Zelensky's decree, seeking to claim all of these Russian territories as a Ukrainian, um, well, of course, it's the sort of thing which might appeal to Budanov, who has these ideological affinities. Perhaps Budanov previously was close to Zeluzhny. I don't know, but this might win him over. It might win support of nationalist hardliners in Kiev to Zelensky and, of course, to Budanov. But, of course, it might have a further purpose that if you are now working towards setting up an insurgency, you might want to extend that insurgency into Russia itself. And perhaps the way to do it is by claiming large territories that are unequivocally Russian, by claiming them as your own. That way you can justify carrying out all kinds of activities there. You can say this is not terrorism, this is resistance. It is resistance by the local people against the Russian occupiers and oppressors. And just say, maybe this is where all this is heading. Now, I'm going to say straight away what I said when this idea was first floated before the special military operation began. If this is the latest plan, Zelensky's and Budanov's plan maybe, the plan of some people in Washington, for all I know, the plan of some people in Britain, and perhaps in the European Union as well, then it is a terrible plan. Um, doing it inevitably means that you're going to have to create networks, whole networks of people in Europe, bases, arms supplies, and all that kind of thing, in order to be able to conduct this insurgency within Ukraine. And you're going to have armed people, some with violent backgrounds, some with radical views. Again, I'm being very euphemistic. Operating like this in on European territory, um, engaged in covert activities. It's almost impossible to see how this can be prevented from spinning out of control. Um, whatever insurgency manages to take off on Ukrainian territory, um, this looks like a formula for spreading instability and violence into Europe itself. But I'm going to suggest anyway that this isn't going to succeed in Ukraine. The Russians obviously know all about this. They have probably largely penetrated at least some parts of Budanov's network already by now. They've shown in the Northern Caucasus that they're, and in Syria that they are extremely skilled at dealing with counterinsurgencies, uh, in, in engaging in counterinsurgency operations. And besides, insurgencies, if they are to succeed, need the support of the local people. And all the reports that are now coming out from Ukraine, which seem to me to be reliable or to have a feeling of objectivity about them, well, they all say the same thing, that the, country, the nation, the Ukrainian nation, is becoming demoralized, and exhausted, that people are increasingly resentful and angry and want to see the war end, and they want to go back to safe and settled conditions of life. Now, there has been a comment which has appeared on 
a thread on Twitter X, which has attracted a great deal of attention and which is directly to the point of this. Now, I have been uh, uncertain about whether to discuss this um, comment because the person who wrote it, who does not appear to be somebody who is deep into geopolitics and doesn't appear to have any particular strong political or um, other positions on this war. Anyway, she, this person has come in for an inevitable amount of abuse. Um, and I don't know much about this person. And I don't want to make her life even more difficult than it already is. But having said that, there's been so much commentary now. This particular comment on Twitter X has now been so widely cited by so many people that I have to say I've gradually, and with apologies, come round to the view that my citing it in terms of the difficulties and problems it might cause to this person, it's going to make no difference. So I am going to uh, discuss it, and in fact, I'm going to actually quote, quote it, because it seems to me that it is that of an eyewitness who has just been to Ukraine and who's had contacts with people in Ukraine. And everything that I am hearing is consistent with what this comment says. And it puts it very clearly, the whole situation within Ukraine, very clearly and very well. And as I said, it goes directly to the point which I've just been making about the lack of wisdom in promoting an insurgency um, in Ukraine if the conventional war is about to be lost. So this is what this comment says. I just got back from Ukraine where I was visiting some friends. Everything we have heard about what's happening in Ukraine is a lie. The reality is darker, bleaker and unequivocally hopeless. There is no such thing as Ukraine winning this war. By their estimates, they have lost over one million of their sons, fathers and husbands. An entire generation is gone. That is, I suspect, an overly high estimate, but never mind. Even in the southwest, where the anti-Russian sentiment is long-standing, citizens are reluctant or straight-up scared to publicly criticise Zelensky. They will go to jail. In every village and town, the streets, shops and restaurants are mostly absent of men. The few men who remain are terrified of leaving their homes for fear of being kidnapped into conscription. Some have resorted to begging friends to break their legs to avoid service. Army search parties take place in the morning, early in the morning, when men leave their homes to go to work. They ambush and kidnap them off the streets, and within three to four hours, they get listed in the army and taken away straight to the front lines with minimal or no training at all. It is a death sentence. It is getting worse every day. Where I was staying, a dentist had just been taken by security forces on his way to work, leaving behind two small children. Every day, three to five dead bodies keep arriving from the front lines. Mothers and wives fight tooth and nail with the armed forces, beg and plead not to have their men taken away. They try bribing, and some which sometimes works, but most of the time they're met with physical violence and death threats. The territory celebrated as having been won back from Russia has been reduced to rubble and is uninhabitable. uninhabitable. 
Regardless, there is no one left to live there and displaced families will likely never return. The, they see the way, the way the war has been reported at home and abroad. It's a joke and propaganda. They say, look around, is this winning? Worse, some have been hoaxed into believing that once Ukrainian forces are exhausted, American soldiers will come in to replace them and win the war. There is no ambiguity in these people. The war was for nothing, a travesty. The outcome always was and is clear. The people are hopeless, utterly destroyed and living in an unending nightmare. They are pleading for an end, any end, most likely the same peace that could have been achieved two years ago. In their minds, they have already lost for their sons, fathers and husbands are gone and their country has been destroyed. There is no victory that can change that. Make no mistake, they are angry with Putin, but they are also angry with Zelensky and the West. They have lost everything, worst of all, hope and faith, and cannot comprehend why Zelensky wishes to continue the current trajectory, the one of human devastation. I didn't witness the war, but what I saw was absolutely heartbreaking. Shame on the people, regardless of their intentions, who have supported this war. And shame on the media for continuing to lie about it. Now, there is so much in this comment which could be addressed at so many levels. I have to say, it echoes my sentiments right from the start of this war. Exactly. This was an eminently avoidable, preventable war. All kinds of things could have been agreed diplomatically that could have prevented it. The insistence, in my opinion, on Ukraine's eventual entry into NATO, which it is becoming more and more clear, was always the ultimate plan. To my mind, is what has led us to this terrible pass. But for the purpose of this program, let me just go back to the essential point. A country as exhausted, as demoralized as this one, if you believe this comment, which I do, by the way, is this a country which could support the kind of insurgency that some people apparently are planning. And I've seen reports now that are increasingly talking about this. Is this a country where you would want to arrange an insurgency? Surely the unhappy people of this country, what they need now is to be left alone so that they can mourn those they have lost and can put their lives back together again. <laughs> and note what this person says. People yeah, continue to be angry with Putin, but they are also angry with Zelensky and the West. The West as well. And this again reminds me so much of that conflict in the Northern Caucasus where the insurgency that took place there was getting an awful lot of verbal and rhetorical and perhaps other support from the West. And in the end, what that brought about was a revulsion against the West on the part of the people of the Northern Caucasus who felt, came to feel increasingly that the West was using them and accordingly caused them to turn against the West. Surely, in, surely this is logical from what we know about the war. And surely, rather than plan or project or plot further insurgencies in Ukraine, seeking to prolong the war in some way as part of whatever schemes there are to 
continue to weaken the Russians, surely the better thing to do now is to put all that aside and to seek peace. What apparently more and more people in Ukraine now want, even opinion polls in Ukraine, which are probably controlled to some degree, are showing a significant collapse in Zelensky's popularity and that of his party, and a growing mistrust and disillusion with his government. Well, one of the tragic aspects of this conflict is that though the facts are obvious to me and have been all along, um, the tragedy has also been obvious to me and has been so all along. So many people in the West continue to deny it they continue to insist otherwise. They continue to create fantasy stories about Ukrainian triumphs, about Ukrainian Bradleys knocking out Russian tanks with 24, 25 millimeter cannon, for example, one of the latest ones. They thrilled at news that LNG terminals in St. Petersburg have been destroyed. They brag, as the British Ministry of Defence is currently doing, that Ukrainian grain ships are able to pass through the Black Sea. Um, as I've said already, if the Russians really wanted to impose a blockade on Ukraine, they have every means to do so. They could quite easily sink those grain ships. The reason they are not doing it is because they know perfectly well what well, they have figured out that doing so would cause enormous political trouble for Russia. It would undermine support for Russia in the global south, and it simply isn't worth it. But anyway, they can people can choose to indulge in these fancies, but must they really add an insurgency upon an already failed war? And must they really, if that is what they want to do, start working with someone like Budanov, who conducts interviews from darkened rooms and spreads fantasies about President Putin suffering from cancer and being <laughs> represented on Russian television by duplicates or clones or doubles. Anyway, we will see. Uh, for the moment, I have to say, I wonder whether anyone in the West, in authority, has any real plan. But I am starting to wonder that this disastrous insurgency idea is becoming increasingly the default plan as all other options gradually run out. Now, before I finish this video, I want to return briefly to the topic of the French mercenaries in Kharkov. Now, yesterday in my programme, I said that 200 had been killed. I see that the figure now has been quietly reduced to 60. Nonetheless, it is undoubtedly the case that a significant number of French mercenaries, let's call them that, were killed in this hotel. And we're now starting to get publication of the names of some of them. And I have already in my previous video spoken about, or last but one video, spoken about how there is clearly some major incident behind all of this. The Russians called in the French ambassador spoke with him for several hours, and Macron came out afterwards with a statement in which he insisted that France is not actually at war with Russia, which strongly suggested to me that whatever it was that happened with these people in this hotel, 
um, the Russians were telling the French ambassador that as far as they were concerned, what these people were doing amounted to an act of war by France. Well, I've now received more reports about this incident, including one from a very reliable source, who, however, has admitted to me that he's obtained this information at second hand from an unimpeachable source, as he puts it, but one which whose identity he cannot disclose. So that means that I'm getting this information at third hand, and one always worries about this sort of thing. But this information is logical and it stacks up. And I noticed that Larry Johnson, who might of course be getting the information from the same people as I am, but anyway, Larry Johnson at Sonar 21 has basically said the same thing on a YouTube program. What appears to have happened, or at least what these sources say happened, is that these people who were in this hotel, most of them were members of the French Foreign Legion. Some of them uh, were of Russian, Ukrainian or Belarusian ethnicities. They'd received high level of training within the French Foreign Legion. Um, the French government basically urged them to go to Ukraine, even though that meant a formal break in their contracts. They went to Ukraine. They were organized in units there. <laughs> um, they carried out various activities behind Russian lines. This is according to this, these sources. They carried out some of these activities within the territory of pre-2014 Russia. Again, according to these sources, they were at least in part directed in what they were doing by French intelligence officers who appear to have been there, located in this hotel from where this operation was being conducted. And the Russians captured some of these people, found out what was going on, became increasingly angry. Um, they saw through the pretense that these were not French soldiers. Apparently, they continue to receive some kind of payouts from France, even though technically they're not members of the Foreign Legion anymore. And apparently, the service, their service in this combat role, is being counted as service for the Foreign Legion in terms of future benefits. But anyway, that's again what these sources say. Anyway, the Russians had enough. A decision was made at the highest level that they were going to put a stop to it. They sent missiles at this hotel. Massive destruction was done. People were killed. The ambassador was called in. The Russians said to the ambassador, let's not beat about the bush. These are French soldiers. They've been engaging in direct military operations against Russia, and we're treating it as an act of war. And the Ru French, of course, refused to accept that. They made all these defiant statements. No, we're not at war. We mustn't allow Russia to win. And they said that these are people, volunteers, these are volunteers who've gone to fight in Ukraine. And, of course, the French have also announced further armed supplies to Ukraine, 50 precision-guided bombs a month, 75 Caesar howitzers, and that sort of thing. So, again, I want to stress this is it's purely information. I'm getting a third hand, and I want to stress that, a third hand. But it looks to me like, far and away, the most plausible explanation of what has happened. I'd previously thought that it might be connected with air defense work, but it seems not. It seems it was something even more direct, in a sense. It was actual 
military operations by these people behind Russian lines. So, anyway, you could say that in some shape or form, this is a little like conducting an insurgency or perhaps preparing the grounds for an insurgency. You use special forces troops to set things up. It's more examples of the sort of cloak and dagger operations, which I have to say straight away, I think Western governments are far too attracted to. I think that I myself, I'm going to make no secret about this, I'm frankly very sceptical that they change anything much in the end, um, certainly in terms of conflicts with great powers. I think all they do is irritate. I don't think they change anything, uh, anything substantial. And of course, if they draw us into a long-term insurgency war, well, this is a disaster. But anyway, that, it seems to me, is the best explanation I've seen so far for this incident. I can't, as I said, vouch for its absolute truth, but it seems to me that it is the most plausible explanation that I have seen so far. And I would anyway like to thank the person, or rather I should say persons, who have provided me with this information. Well, there we go. That is the situation in Ukraine, as I understand it. Bad situation on the battlefields, deepening tensions in Kiev, talk about insurgencies, and that seems to be now the new plan. Um, all happening against the backdrop of demoralization and devastation in Ukraine of a sort that was predictable from the very first moment when this conflict began. We are trapped or so it seems to me, into this cycle of escalation that doesn't seem to be anybody able to step back and say stop, and who knows what will happen. Meanwhile, we're drifting into this conflict into the Middle, into the Middle East, which I will, I promise, return to in my next video. But this is where I stop my video today. More from me soon. Let me remind you again that you can find all our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble and X. You can also support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar. Links under this video. Don't forget to check out our shop where you can buy all sorts of amazing things, magic mugs, hats, hoodies, t-shirts, sweatshirts, all those great things. And we are giving a 15% discount on shirts at the moment in our shop. So please remember to look them up. And last but not least, remember, if you like this video, to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me again today. More from me soon. Have a very good day.